All right, so let's take a look at Engel's theorem. This version of Engel's theorem is called the common eigenvector formulation. Um, and it's not really the same one as presented in Humphrey, but it's the theorem right before that. So let's take a look at this theorem. theorem. Let L be a subalgebra of GL of V, V a vector space of finite dimension. If for all x and l, um, x is no potent, then there exists a common eigenvector v not equal to 0 with eigenvalue 0. So I've phrased it this way, that there exists v not equal 0 such that x v equals 0. And so this is why we think of it as a common eigenvector. It's a common eigenvector for every vector, uh, every element of L. So the way we're going to prove this theorem is by induction on dimension of L. If we look closely, we already know that this is true for um, the dimension 0 and 1 case. Um, and that's because, well, in when it's dim 0 um, or dim L equals 0, Right, it's obvious, so that's there. And then when it's dim L equals one, we saw in the previous video that if X is an element of GL of V, there exists a non-zero V such that X V equals zero. So then clearly any vector in the span of X also satisfies this. So if L is one dimensional, it would be the span of some vector. So it's, it's true in our base cases, so it kind of motivates us to do induction. So the way we're going to do this is decompose L into two pieces. And the, what we want to do is choose these pieces wisely so that if we apply the inductive hypothesis to one of them, let's say this piece, we're going to get a common eigenvector because this piece will have less than, uh, dimension less than that of L. So once we find our common eigenvector for this guy, we're going to hope that it also works for this guy. And so if we do this right, then if it's a common eigenvector for this and for this, then it's going to be a common eigenvector for this space. So to, to kind of go in that route, consider a maximal proper subalgebra of L called K. So we're going to put k in this box here. We don't know if it works yet, but it, it's going to work. So the reason we want to make it maximal is because it's, it makes sense. right? You would want one really big piece here and then one really small piece here. And hopefully you want to apply the inductive hypothesis to as many vectors as possible. Ideally, this piece would be of dimension l minus 1, and this would just be one vector. And then it would be easier to kind of find this guy. So that's why we want a maximal, and then proper just means it's strictly contained, right? So we know that dim k is greater than or equal to 1 because the span of any vector in L is going to be um, a subalgebra. So I should probably mention, right, if it wasn't clear, that dim L is assumed to be greater than or equal to 2 because um, we already know these two, the 0 and 1 dimensional cases. So we have 1 less than or equal to dim k less than dim l. So the way we're going to identify this piece is consider the quotient space l mod k. right? And it makes sense that we kind of factor out k to consider what's left over. And in particular, we want to use the adjoint representation because the adjoint representation is a representation of l back into l. So we can kind of act on l. Um, or L quotient K, right? Because they're all related. And hopefully we can find this missing piece. So the idea is to work with the quotient space and adjoint representation. So we have K. We call K, I'll draw a picture, L and K. And so adjoint is a map from L into GL of L, right? 
And so then the adjoint representations, um, the, the way we'd want to work with L mod K, right, would be the factor representation. So that would be add L quotient K would be a map from L into GL of L mod K. But this map is actually not well defined because we don't know if K is invariant under the adjoint. It's only invariant if it's an ideal. Um, let me say that, invariant under adjoint if it's an ideal. And we don't, we're not entirely sure that it is an ideal, we just know it's a subalgebra. So the way to kind of circumvent this issue, because we really want the factor representation to consider L quotient K, we're just going to restrict add to K, right? So in this, this actually works now because um, K is a subalgebra. So if we restrict add, um, so for all S and T in K, S bracket T is an element of K by virtue of being a subalgebra. So now we can consider the restriction of adjoint to L quotient K. Adjoint restricted to L quotient K is a map from K into GL of L quotient K. So if we look at our hierarchy, right, we have dim Ks here, and that's obviously less than dim L. And then the image of K under any homomorphism obviously has to be less than or equal to the uh, dimension of K in dimension. So dim add L quotient K restricted to K is going to have dimension less than that of K. And so this is nice because everything in, the, in L is nilpotent, right, the given, and then everything in here is obviously going to be nilpotent because it's contained in L. And so we, what we have is we're doing this adjoint representation of K and then we kind of slide it down onto L quotient K. And so we saw in the previous video that if, if X is nilpotent, then add X is nilpotent. So it follows um, that these, the guys in here, this, this space, are all nilpotent. So what we can go up and realize is we can actually apply our theorem, our inductive, hi the indic inductive hypothesis to the space. So what we see is that there exists a V for all the guys in this space. We have to slow down because we want to make sure we work with the right algebraic elements. So the, the space of this guy, right, add, so let's say, um, I need a variable name, so I'll say P. Right, so P element of add L quotient K of R is actually an element of GL of L quotient K. So it acts on vectors of the form, so um, of the form L plus K, right? That's what we have here. So I wanna be careful with the notation, right? And so what we can say is guys in here so let's kind of take a step back. Um, add R of L quotient K. If you take S and K, so for all S and K, this guy is going to act on L plus K, where L plus K is some arbitrary vector in the quotient space. And this is going to equal, by definition, um, add restricted of S acting on L plus K which is the same thing as S bracket L plus K. So by the inductive hypothesis, there exists a vector in our quotient space now, because that's the space of interest. So I'll call it Y plus K um, element of L quotient K, such that for all, um, we'll say S in K add restricted L quotient K of S, Y plus K is equal to the zero vector, which in the quotient space is zero plus K. So this is actually just restating our theorem in the quotient space world. And um, 
the the way we're acting right are these nilpotent operators that are contained in um, GL of L quotient K, right? So it makes sense that he's going to act on Y plus K. So these guys, th th this thing here is can be just simplified to saying that S bracket Y plus K is equal to zero plus K, which implies that S bracket Y is an element of K. But we know that the inductive hypothesis that this thing is non-zero. So what that means is that y is actually not an element of k. So what's interesting, right, is that if we consider k direct sum span y, if you take y and then you bracket with anything in k, you're going to end up back in k. So in particular, if you call this, this algebra q, it's closed under the bracket. Close under the bracket. But notice how this is actually clearly of dimension greater than the dimension of k. Dim q is greater than dim k. But we said k was maximal. So the only way this is allowed, because k is a proper subalgebra, is that q is not proper. So that means q is actually L. So what we have is L is equal to k direct sum span y. So that's why we do all of this, is to find these two pieces now, is that we are using the um, factor representation to find this vector y, right? And we had to apply the inductive hypothesis to a entirely different space structurally, but the, the theorem does not say anything about quotient spaces or anything. It just says, for an arbitrary vector space of finite dimension, and this guy has finite dimension. So that's why this works. But we're not done yet, right? We have this, but we still haven't found the common eigenvector. So the way we're going to do that is we're actually going to apply the inductive hypothesis to this guy, because he has dimension less than L. Um, and so I, I mentioned in the parentheses above, but this is strong induction. We're not just assuming the statement is true for dim L um, minus 1. We're assuming it for all um, integers less than uh, L positive integers, less than dim L. So we can apply the inductive hypothesis to K, uh, which actually by the statement has dim L minus one, but we, we needed the strong induction for the adjoint stuff up there. So what we can say here now is that define V naught is equal to, this, th this thing is called a weight space, by the way, with weight zero, um, all V in V such that, uh, SV is equal to zero for all S and K, right? And we know V naught is, is uh, not equal to zero because of the uh, inductive hypothesis. We know that there is, it has at least dimension one. So there exists non-zero V in V naught, right? And so these Vs uh, are an element of V, not the uh, L quotient K we were looking at earlier. So we have this, this guy here. Now just keep this in mind. And now to take an arbitrary V element of V naught, um, which has great dimension greater than zero. So Consider S bracket Y for arbitrary S in K. For any S in K, S bracket Y is equal to S Y minus Y S. And this Y here is the same Y we found up here that completes uh, K. So now if we, these guys are all matrices, so we can just multiply them by V. And so um, what we should have is that S bracket Y times V is equal to s y minus y s times v. But notice that this guy, right, is actually a contained in s because we we saw that um, s bracket y is an element of k for any arbitrary s. So what this is is that s prime v is equal to s y, oops, not an s, s y minus y s times v. So 
S prime V has to be zero because V is an element of this weight space, right, up here. So the SV equals zero for all S and K. So this guy is zero. And this right-hand side is equal to SY times V minus YS times V. And then you see here you have SV. And so because V is in the weight space, this disappears. So we have a zero is equal to S times YV minus zero. So this tells us that SYV is equal to zero. So if we just view this vector, we see that YV is an element of V naught, right? Because S was arbitrary. So this has to be true for all S. Um, so note that Y is an element of L, obviously. So Y is nilpotent by assumption. Then there exists n such that y to the n equals 0 and y to the n minus 1 is not equal to 0, right? So if y to the n minus 1 is not equal to 0, that means y to the n minus 1 times v is non-zero, is not the zero subspace. Um, so take uh, v element of, or I'll say w element of y to the n minus 1 times v, and w not equal to 0, then clearly, clearly uh, y times w is going to equal uh, y times y to the n minus 1 times v for some v, because we can say w equals y to the n minus 1 times v by this thing here. And so this is equal to 0. But also note that um, yv is an element of v0, and so then y times yv is an element of v0, and then y cubed times v is an element of v0, and so on. So it follows that y to the n minus 1 times v is an element of v0. So the vector, the vector y to the n minus 1 times v is killed by y, as we saw above here. And because y to the n minus 1 times v is an element of v naught, um, it is killed by stuff in k. And when I say killed, I mean when you take um, zero, all of this stuff. And when I say killed, I mean that you take anything in K and then you multiply it by V and you're going to get zero. So we're done. We found our vector that is annihilated by everything in L because, because L, L equals um, K direct sum span Y. And we know that uh, this guy kills y to the n minus 1 v, not, oops, lowercase v, yeah. And this, and so does this guy, both kill, that means L kills it. And so we found our common eigenvector. So the gist of this proof lies on uh, induction and a decomposing it into these two pieces and then coming back and then uh, showing that 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 we can find the vector in um, the weight space here this guy that is killed by both k and w killed by y so that concludes the proof of the common eigenvectors formulation of Engel's theorem which I'll state again one last time for good measure so coming back up here let L be a subalgebra of G over V, V finite dimensional. If for all X, uh, X is nilpotent, then there exists a non-zero V such that X V equals zero. So that is our theorem. Thank you for watching.